Shalom, shalom, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to Trumpet's Call. I'm Maria. I pray that you are holding on to faith, Amuna, and holding on to hope during these times. Thank you for joining me once again for another session of our Sunrise Manna. And in today's session of our Sunrise Manna, we're going to be talking about sinners and their prayers. Does the Most High hear the prayers of sinners? Well, scripture seems to indicate that he does not. But then if he didn't, how would any of us be saved? We're going to talk about that today. So let's get started. We're going to begin reading in John, Yahukanon, chapter 9, We're reading about the man born blind. Okay. And in the beginning of this chapter, we see the disciples, the Talmudim of Messiah asking him why this man was born blind. They say, was it his sin? Or was it the sin of his parents? Now, many people have used the scripture and verse to justify the belief in reincarnation. They say, well, the Talmudim are seeming to indicate that this man sinned before he was born. That means he must have been here before in another body to sin, and that's why he was born blind. Now, Messiah didn't really respond to that. He didn't say, no, reincarnation doesn't exist. No, he wasn't here before. He just said, this man did not sin, nor did his parents sin. And then he gave him the reason for why he was born blind. But is it possible that sometimes when we come into this world, we come with judgment already on our head based on the things that we do in this life? Could it be that that is what the disciples, the Talmudim, were talking about when they referenced his sin? Could it be? We know the scripture is very clear that it is appointed unto us once to die, and after that, the judgment. So this doesn't necessarily teach a belief or concept of reincarnation as much as it teaches us that there are consequences for our actions. There are. So in the story, we see that our Messiah confronts this man or approaches him and asks him if he desires to be healed, and he placed clay on his eyes and sent him to the pool of Siloam to wash his eyes so that he may receive his healing. And when the religious leaders heard about it, they were thinking, hmm, how did this man born blind, how did he receive his sight? And so they're very curious about what happened, okay? And so he's now talking to the religious leaders about how he received his healing. Verse 10, Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes opened? He answered and said, A man that is called Yahusha made clay and anointed mine eyes, and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received my sight. Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees him that afore was blind. And it was the Sabbath day, when Yahusha made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. And he said unto them, He put clay on mine eyes, and I washed, and I do see. And therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of Yahuwah, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others say, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. And rightfully so, there should have been a division. There should have been people saying, wait a minute now. How can we call this man a sinner when clearly he is doing the works of the Father? If there is a presence that's doing good and doing the works of the Father through the Father's power, the Father's anointing, how can we call that person who was doing those works evil if he's doing the Father's bidding? And so they're not thinking about that. They're just thinking, we don't agree with him. We heard that he was born under curious circumstances, that his father, Joseph, really isn't his father. So we don't believe he's a righteous man. He doesn't do the things we want him to do. He can't be controlled by us. He's breaking Shabbat by working on Shabbat, by doing the works of the father on Shabbat. He can't be a righteous man because he's doing good works on the Shabbat. So he must be a sinner. Okay, and so they're asking very good questions right now as if to say, if he was really a sinner, could he really perform these miracles? So we're going to go back for just a second and talk about 
why I believe Messiah had this blind man go to the pool of Siloam. Now, we're told that the word Siloam means sent. And so Messiah sends the blind man with clay on his eyes to a place called sent so that he might receive his healing. And so as I was consulting the father about this, my understanding about this is that when Messiah placed the clay on the blind man's eyes, what we're seeing here, among other things, I'm sure, is an allusion to the fact that the father who is doing the work, remember, let us remember that the father is doing the work. Messiah testifies and says, this is the father's work. He's doing these things through me. So by placing clay on the blind man's eyes, we're seeing a picture of the father as the master potter. He is the potter and we are the clay. And so the father takes more clay and places it on the eyes of the man born blind so that he can get new eyes. Because who is able to do anything? Who is able to perform all miracles? Who is able to give new eyes where the old ones don't work anymore? Who is able to give new ears or new body parts, new organs? The father is because he is the master potter, the master creator. And we see this in the story as we see the father through the son applying clay to the blind man's eyes. And then he sent him to a place called sent. So the blind man was sent. He was sent as an act of faith, I believe. It's good to say, I believe. It's good to say, please heal me and please do these really wonderful and kind things for me. But when you have to activate your faith and act on what you believe, that's where the rubber meets the road, brothers and sisters. Think about how difficult it must have been for this blind man with clay on his eyes to make it to a pool. Now, I'm not sure exactly how far away the pool was. Let's say it was 20 feet. Let's say it was 200 yards. Let's say it was a mile away. Whatever distance, it's difficult traveling if you're blind and you cannot see. So it took an act of faith for this blind man to believe Messiah and then make his way to this pool and wash. And he came back seeing. Hallelujah. Now the question is, if he had not gone to the pool, if he had received the clay on his eyes, but did not go to the pool, would he have received his healing? That's the question. What do you think? Would he have received his healing had he not gone to the pool and just walked around the rest of his life with clay on his eyes? Is it possible that there are situations and circumstances in our lives, brothers and sisters, where we ask the Father for something and he gives us the first stage of what he desires to do in our lives, the first stage of our healing, he places the clay on our eyes, but we don't follow up by doing what he told us to do, go to the pool. We don't allow ourselves to be sent to where he has told us to go so that he might complete his work in us. Is it possible? It's very possible. So let's continue on. They say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him, that he hath opened thine eyes? And he said, He is a prophet. But the Jews, the Yahudim, did not believe concerning him, that he had been blind and received his sight, until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, who ye say was born blind? How then doth he now see? So these religious leaders are going above and beyond to try to prove that this miracle did not happen. It's really interesting how people do that. Really interesting. So they call his parents and they say, prove to us that this man was born blind. I mean, really, how could he have been healed, right? Continuing, his parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, the Yahudim, for the Yahudim had already agreed that if any man did confess that he was Mashiach, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, said his parents, he is of age, ask him. So they sidestepped that. They went, well, we're not going to get put out of the synagogue today. So we're going to say, let our son, who is a man, let him speak for himself. We don't know how he got healed. 
We just know he was born blind. You ask him. Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give Yahuwah the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Then said they unto him again, What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He then answered them, I have told you already, and you did not hear. So I guess maybe they thought, if we try to cajole and convince him, maybe he'll change his story. He's being interrogated, and maybe he'll change his story. But the blind man, or the formerly blind man, he maintained his story. I was blind, and now I see. So interesting here how they have already judged Messiah to be a sinner. They say to the blind man, the former blind man, we know, like, we know this man is a sinner. And we know that no sinner can perform miracles. So what you're seeing is this man who you think is a sinner performing a miracle. So that proves that he's not a sinner, right? But they would rather believe that the blind man wasn't really blind and that they're being led astray by the parents or by the man or by society or by whomever rather than alter their original opinion that the man who they think is a sinner is actually righteous and not only righteous but sent by the father doing his works they refuse to let go of their prejudice and their hatred against him against our messiah continuing wherefore would ye hear it again will ye also be his disciples his talmudim then they reviled him you know that word revile that's a very strong word it's like saying they despised him they hated him now these are religious leaders they're supposed to be the ones who teach people how to keep torah right you know the torah that says love your neighbor as you love yourself they reviled him and said thou art his disciples but we are moses's disciples masha's disciples we know that yahuwah spake unto moses as for this fellow We know not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, Why herein is a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened my eyes. I love love this man. He's telling them, hmm, it's really amazing. You don't know where this man came from. You don't know anything about him. But hey, wonder of wonders, he's opened my eyes. He did this. He did this through the power of the Most High. But also notice how the religious leaders here, they claim Moses, they claim Masha, but they would not claim Messiah. The law, the Torah came through Masha, but grace and truth came through Yahushua Hamashiach. And it's through that grace and truth, the, the compassion and the love of the Father, that Yahushua reached out to this blind man and gave him his sight. But these religious leaders, they wouldn't have given this blind man anything. They didn't even, they probably didn't even want his healing for him. You don't see them rejoicing with him. You don't see them saying, wow, you were blind and now you see. Praise Yahuwah. These religious leaders are telling the blind man, praise Yahuwah for your healing. But they're not praising. They're not saying, praise Yahuwah for your healing. And there are times in our lives, brothers and sisters, where there are people who say they're for you, but they're not for you. The Father does something wonderful in your life. He performs a miracle for you. He does something for you that is praiseworthy. And they just sit back and go, how do you know that was the father? I don't know about that. And they have all these things to say, but they won't worship with you or rejoice with you when the father does something miraculous in your life. Continuing. Now we know that Yahuwah heareth not sinners. And this is the crux of the messages because they are speaking truth here. These religious leaders are speaking truth. They are saying something that is true. They say, now we know that Yahuwah heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of Yahuwah and doeth his will, him he heareth. They are speaking truth. This is Torah. This is what Torah teaches. So clearly they read it and clearly they have understanding regarding it. But for some reason, they can't seem to understand that Yahushua was sent by the Father. They can't seem to understand that. But they do understand that the Father does not hear the prayer of sinners. But if you're righteous and if you worship the Father, 
he'll hear you, and he'll do miraculous deeds on your behalf. The logical conclusion for them is, then, to believe that Yahushua was sent by the Father and that he was who he said he was. But they wouldn't believe. They would not believe. Continuing. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of Yahuwah, he could do nothing. That's absolutely true. If he wasn't of the Most High, he could do nothing. And yet, he did something. Through the power of the Most High, he healed a man born blind. And according to them, no one has ever heard of a man being born blind, being healed up until that time. So the works testify to who Messiah really was and who sent him and who was in him doing the works. The works testify, but they are ignoring the signs. They're ignoring the works so that they can cling to their own conclusion that they have drawn about our Messiah. So I want to focus in on verse 31. Now we know that Yahuwah heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of Yahuwah and doeth his will, him he heareth. This is really an important statement for us, especially at this time. Because when we sinned against the Most High and we made him into our enemy, so to speak, he did not hear our prayer. He didn't. We cried out for mercy. We cried out for deliverance. We cried out to be delivered from slavery. We'd say, oh, come by ya, come by ya, come by ya, deliver me, save me. The father did not hear our prayer. In his tender mercies, he brought emancipation because he's kind and because he's good. And it hurts him to see his children hurt. But for sinners, those who make themselves his enemies, those who turn against him and turn away from him, He is under no obligation to hear the prayers of sinners. So for us and our purposes now, as we turn back to the Father and as we are seeking his face and turning away from Babylon and turning back to the Father, it is important that we walk before him and be thou perfect. It is important that we not sin against him so that he will hear our prayers. Because the religious leaders actually spoke truth when they said that the Father does not hear the prayer of sinners. And to demonstrate this, we're going to go back to the Tanakh, to the books of what's called the Old Testament, and see some passages that were clearly written regarding the Father and his hearing the prayer of sinner or not. We'll read in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 29. Yahuwah is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. There it is right there. Yahuwah is far from the wicked, but... He hears the prayer of the righteous, meaning he doesn't hear the prayer of the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. Proverbs 28, verse 9. He who turns away his ear from listening to the law, to the Torah, even his prayer is an abomination. If you turn away from keeping the Most High's commandments, his laws, your prayer to the Most High are as an abomination. He will not receive them. He will not hear you. Isaiah, or Yasha Yahu. 115. So when you spread your hands out in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Psalm 145, Tahalim, verse 19. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. The Father hears the prayers and the cries of those who fear him and those who obey his commandments. Once again, he is under no obligation to hear the prayers of sinners. And brothers and sisters, there's some of us who have been praying and asking the Most High to do things for us. We've been praying. We've been praying and praying and praying. And perhaps we haven't seen the answer that we've been seeking. We haven't seen it come to pass. It could be because the Father is saying, not yet. Wait on me. Wait on me. But it also could be the Father's not hearing you. If you're engaged in open sin against the Most High, if you are in rebellion, if you have been told to do something and you won't do it, you won't step out and do what the Father has called you to do, you won't allow yourself to be Siloam, sent, 
You won't allow the master potter to place his clay on you and mold you and make you and turn you into what he desires for you to be. If you are in rebellion against the Most High, he is under no obligation to hear your prayer. And perhaps you're not receiving the answer to your prayer because you're not being heard. Because as it says in Yasha Yahu, chapter 1, verse 15, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Is it possible? That's a question to ask yourself. Is it possible? Continuing. We read in Job or Yub 35.12. There they cry out, but he does not answer because of the pride of evil men. In Psalm Tehillim 18 verse 41. They cried for help, but there was none to save, even to Yahuwah, but he did not answer them. Why? Because they were in sin. They were in rebellion against the Most High. Tehillim 34, 15 through 16. In the eyes of Yahuwah, the eyes of Yahuwah are toward the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of Yahuwah is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. It's a really serious statement right here. Those who were wicked, whether Hebrew or Gentile, the Most High is not going to rescue you. He is not going to save you if you are in rebellion against him, if you refuse to do what he's called you to do, if you refuse to repent, if you refuse to turn away from your sin. You're going to experience the just deserts of your action. You're going to be judged along with the wicked. The Father is very clear. He loves us, but he will not coddle us like that. He loves us, but he won't reward us for our bad behavior. He won't do it. He won't. Proverbs 21, verse 13. He who shuts his ear to the cry of the poor will also cry himself and will not be answered. So we see here that in the presence of someone who is in need, if you don't answer their cries for help, you won't be answered. There is this divine tit for tat, this divine quid pro quo, this divine reaping and sowing. So if there's a need and you can meet the need, meet the need. Therefore, thus saith Yahuwah, Behold, I am bringing disaster on them, which they will not be able to escape. Though they will cry to me, yet I will not listen to them. Once again, we see the Father telling us that our sin brings judgment. And when this judgment comes, we may call out to him and ask him to save us and deliver us, but he won't hear. Ezekiel chapter 8 verse 18. Therefore, I indeed will deal in wrath. My eye will have no pity, nor will I spare. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, yet will I not listen to them. Then they will cry out to Yahuwah, but he will not answer them. Instead, he will hide his face from them at that time, because they have practiced evil deeds. Those who practice evil deeds get the Father's face hidden from them. His face is not shining upon them. He's not granting them salvation. He's not granting them shalom. They are under his judgment. He will not hear. So this is a lesson for us today. As we turn back to the Father to get him to hear our cries for deliverance, our cries for salvation, our cries for healing and provision, and all the things that we're asking him to do for us and for our nation, we can't do it from a place of sin. There are some people who come into the awakening and they know that they're Hebrew and nothing changes in their lives. If they were sinners before, they continue to sin before the Most High and think that somehow, some way, being a Hebrew and knowing that you're a Hebrew is enough. It is not. The Father expects us to keep his commandments. He expects us to do those things that are pleasing in his sight. If you are in open sin, the Father is under no obligation to hear your prayer. None. If he hears it, it will be because of his mercies. So you may be asking yourself then, well, how do we get saved? How are we 
ever to experience salvation if the Father is under no obligation to hear the prayers of those who are in sin. We're born and in sin, and in sin and iniquity are we shapen. So if we're born in sin, how does the Father hear us? Our ancestor Dawood said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, Yahuwah will not hear my prayer. So if these things are all true, how is it that he's going to hear us in order to offer us salvation? Well, I believe the answer to that comes in the person whom he sent. The Father sent Messiah to be the salvation of the nation of Yasharal. He sent him, just like Messiah sent the blind man to the pool of Siloam, the Father sent Yahusha with a mission. And as Yahusha carried out his mission, he was to bring salvation to those who did not have audience before the Most High, to those who could not approach him to the Most High because they're in sin, so they could come through the mediator. In the same way that Moses or Masha was a mediator between the children of Yasharal in the wilderness and the Most High, Yahusha is that mediator between us and the Father. Not because the Father hates his children and he won't listen to them, but our sin separates us from the Father. It is our sin that divides and separates. If the Father allowed us into his presence in our sinful state, it would destroy us. We would be immediately judged. Virtue would go out of him and it would judge the sin and we would be destroyed. So it is because of his love that he turns his face away from us when we become dirtied and stained with sin. It's an act of love, an act of mercy, an act of compassion. Yahusha is the bridge. He is the doorway that we enter into that has a streaming flow of blood, life-cleansing, life-altering blood that falls upon us as we enter the door of his flesh. As we become one with him, he cleanses us from our sin. And then we are able to approach unto the Father being made righteous by Yahusha's righteousness. Because as Yahusha is, so are we in this world when we become one with him. And it is because of the Father's mercy and compassion that he sent his son to be that salvation, to be that cleansing flow for us. And it's through him that we can approach unto the Father and be saved and have relationship restored with the Father. But even so, if you've gone through that life cleansing flow and you are having your relationship with the Father restored and you're in relationship with him and you're hearing his voice and you're doing the things that are pleasing in his sight, if you find yourself in open rebellion, whatever, how whatever happens, if you find yourself not doing what he told you to do, not obeying, not giving, not sharing, not being obedient to his commands, he is under no obligation to continue to hear your prayer. So it is very important for us, brothers and sisters, that we check ourselves daily to see whether or not we're still in that flow. We know we're in that flow when the Father's face is shining upon us. And as I said before, if you're not receiving answer to prayer and you've been praying and praying and praying and praying, and praying, it is appropriate to check yourself to see whether or not you're still in the faith, to check yourself to see whether or not you're still in obedience, you're still keeping the commandments, you're still loving the Father, you're still loving your brothers and your sisters. It's important that we check ourselves daily, especially now especially now. So I just wanted to come before you and bring this lesson before you as I, as this was brought to my attention this past week, it became very apparent to me that the Father is righteous and he is set apart and sinners don't get to just traipse into his presence. If they do, they're likely to be destroyed. It is because of the mediator. It is because of our advocate that we're able to approach unto the Father. And some of you may say, well, what about Abraham? What about Dawood? What about David? How do they approach? Messiah wasn't there. How do they approach unto the Father? I believe the Father dealt with our ancestors in light of the blood. Remember, he had our ancestors build a tabernacle in the wilderness. And in that tabernacle, he had them build a box, which he called the Ark of the Covenant. And above that Ark of the Covenant was a place called the Mercy Seat. 
and the mercy seat was the place where the Ruach, where the presence of the Most High dwelt. And he was flanked on either side by cherubim, covering the glory that existed above that set-apart place, the mercy seat. But under the mercy seat was a lid, a lid that led to a box, a box made of carbon, a box that, spiritually speaking, relates to Messiah. It is because of Messiah, who was the Ark of the Covenant, who contained the Torah, and who contained the bread, and who contained the staff of leadership. He is our covenant. The Ark of the Covenant represented Messiah. And the place above Messiah that Messiah led us to was the presence of the Father. So we come to the Ark, and in the Ark we find what we need in it. We find our bread. We find our leadership in that rod. And we find the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, so to speak, written on tablets of stone that would eventually become engraved upon our hearts through our relationship and receiving of the new covenant. So even back then, everything pointed to the presence of Messiah coming and being salvation to our nation that the Father sent. Yahuwah is salvation, but he sent his salvation in and through and by his son. It's important that we know that. And it's important that every bit of relationship that our ancestors had with the Father back before Messiah incarnated as the Messiah was through the lens of the blood of that spotless lamb. The father saw it. He knew what he would do. He allowed the blood of bulls and goats to serve and suffice to cover sins for his nation. He did that for a period of time, but he knew that he would send a better sacrifice, an eternal and enduring sacrifice that ever lives to make intercession for his people. Hallelujah, Huah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, how precious is that flow. That makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Yahusha. Nothing but the blood. It is that precious, precious blood that cleanses us and opens the door wide for us to be able to enter into the Father's presence without being destroyed. Hallelujah. So no, brothers and sisters, the Most High is under no obligation to hear the prayers of sinners, but he made a way for us. He made a way for us through his son, the door, a doorway to the Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for your mercy and your tender compassions for us. Let's pray, brothers and sisters. Ab Yahuwah, we thank you for another day. And we thank you for another day's journey. We thank you for your mercy and your compassion and your tenderness toward your children. You love us so much that you say, obey me, keep my commandments. Because if you don't, there are going to be consequences. And even when there are consequences, you, in your mercy, have already provided a way of escape from the consequences for us through the life of your son. He is that bread from heaven, that bread from the Shamaim, whoever lives to make intercession for us. Yahuwah is salvation, but you have sent your son to stand before us so that we might be saved in and through him. Thank you, Father. Father, if there are any here today who are having their prayers not heard because they're in sin, I pray that you would reveal it. Please reveal it. Show them. Show them what they have done and show them and lead them to a place of repentance through your son. Allow your Ruach to speak to their hearts and bring them back on the straight and narrow path to life. Help them to see, Father, that it is appropriate to confess these things before you so that they might come back before you and be healed and be whole and have their prayers heard and answered. And Father, if there are any who have made requests and they're on the right path, they're doing the things that are pleasing in your sight, give them a confidence that you are hearing them and that you're telling them, not yet, my child. Wait. Wait on me. Wait on me. We thank you, Father, for your goodness unto the children of men. We thank you for your tender mercies and your compassion. We love you. We honor you. And we thank you, Father, that we can come to you and you hear us. 
Hallelujah. You hear us. This is the confidence that we have. That if we, your children, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, if we ask anything according to your will, you hear us. And if we know that you hear us, we know that we have the petitions that we have desired of you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that mercy. Thank you for that grace. Thank you for opening the door for us and granting us an audience with the King. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us into your throne room. Thank you for having mercy upon us. We thank you, Father. We thank you always and eternally for all of the goodness you have done to us and for us. Thank you. My heart says, thank you. Barak Yahuwah. Barak Yahuwah. Barak Yahuwah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Barugata. My soul makes its boast in you, O Father. I rejoice in your goodness. I rejoice in your majesty. I rejoice in your splendor. You are Yahuwah Sabaoth. Beside you, there is no other Savior. We stand before you, forgiven. We stand before you, redeemed. We stand before you, humbly asking that you would manifest the healing, that you would manifest all of the wonderful things that you have in store for our nation. We pray, Father, that you would continually wash us in that flow and that we might stand before you and receive all that you have for us. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. Thank you for hearing us. It is such a privilege, a privilege to be able to enter into your presence and have you hear our prayers. Thank you, Father. All praises to the Most High Yahuwah. Hallelujah. Well, thank you, brothers and sisters, for joining me once again on the channel and for another session of our Sunrise Manna. We're so thankful to the Most High for gracing us that he would hear our prayers. It is a privilege denied to many. Thank you, Father, for choosing us and making us your own once again. Thank you. Hallelujah. May the Most High, Yahuwah, Sabaoth, Baruch, and keep you. Bless and keep you, brothers and sisters. And may he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may Yahuwah, Sabaoth, lift up his countenance upon you and grant you shalom, peace, today and every day. And may the eyes of our understanding continue to be enlightened as we come to understand just what the wonderful benefits of the Most High are to us. May we bow down daily and thank you and praise you for all that you have done for us, Father. For indeed, you are worthy and you do all things well. Shalom and shalom, brothers and sisters. <laughs>